Hey math students, today we're going to be talking about the inverse of a function. So the word inverse means opposite or, well, yeah, basically means opposite, okay? So inverse operations, for example, addition and subtraction are inverse operations because the subtraction undoes what the addition does. And multiplication and division are inverse operations because the division undoes what the multiplication does. Um, let, me, let me give you a, an example. Let's look at the functions uh, f of x equals 3x minus 6. And then let's look at g of x equals 1 third x plus 2. Okay? f and g are inverse functions of one another. And the reason they're inverse functions of one another is g of x undoes what f of, of what f of x does, and f of x undoes what g of x does. Let me give you some examples. Uh, if I have uh, f of, oh, let's say, 2. f of 2 is going to be 3 times 2 minus 6. I said, there we go, 3 times 2 minus 6, and that's 6 minus 6, that equals 0. f of 3 is 3 times 3 minus 6, that's 9 minus 6, that equals 3. f of 4 is 3 times 4 minus 6, that's 12 minus 6, that equals 6. And let's just do one more, f of 5 is 3 times 5 minus 6, which is 15 minus 6, which equals 9. So if I were to illustrate uh, this function with just this domain, I'm going I'm to limit my domain just for this illustration, uh, and uh, so my domain is going to be 2, 3, 4, and 5. I would say 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, can you all see that? I think you can. Okay, I'm using a, a, a mapping diagram here. And this would be my x, and over here would be my... Uh, f of x, and it's going to map to 0, the 3 maps to uh, 3, the 4 maps to 6, and the 5 maps to 9. Okay? Now let's look at the other one. Let's say we have g of 0. g of 0 is going to be 1 third times 0 plus 2, which is 2. And now let's say we have g of 3. 1 third of 3 plus 2 is 1 plus 2, that's going to be 3. And g of 6 is going to be 1 third times 6 plus 2. A third of 6 is 2, plus 2 is going to get me 4. And g of 9 is going to be 1 third times 9 plus 2, that's 3, plus 2 is 5. And so now you can see that if I were going to draw a mapping diagram for uh, this function here, again, just limiting it to, to uh, uh, this domain right here. I would go from, uh, can you see, uh, let's not go that low. I would go from about, I'd say 0, 3, 6, 9 maps to, and let me put another one over here. Uh, these are the x's, these are the y's. The 0 maps to a 2, the 3 maps to a 3, the 6 maps to a, a 4, and the 9 maps to a 5. And now you can see that what happens here is that the range in the domain just gets switched around, okay? If I, uh, um, if I use the same mapping diagram and I just had the arrows going the other way, it would match exactly what we have over here. So G is undoing uh, F. Now, um, so what that means is, if I, so if g really is an inverse of x, what that means is, if I take g of, remember, f, the function f, takes x and turns it into f of x. So that means g would take f of x and turn it into x. So that means g of f of x should equal x. All right, well, let's see. 
uh, if I g something, that means uh, I, uh, I take one third times that something and I add two to it. So this is going to be one third times uh, 3x minus 6 and then I add 2. Okay, distribute the one third and I get one third times 3x is x. One third times 6 is 2 plus 2 and sure enough this equals x. So yes, it does work. And so let, let's just check and see if f really undoes what g does for every single x. Uh, let's see, I'm going to have 3 times g of x minus 6. And I know what g of x is, it's that thing over there. So this is going to be 3 times 1 third x plus 2 minus 6. It's looking pretty good. 3 times 1 third x is x. 3 times 2 is 6 minus 6 and that just equals x. So what do you know? We have figured out that f, if they are uh, uh, inverses, that f of g of x and g of f of x both just equal x if they are inverses of one another. Okay? You might notice that I spelled if wrong. Yeah. Uh, this is what mathematicians do. If spelled I-F-F -F means if and only if. Okay? So what that means is if this is true, if f of g of x and g of f of x both equal x, then these functions must be inverses. And if these functions are inverses of each other, then this must be true, okay? So it's like, a, uh, it's, it's like an if-then uh, statement, except it goes either way, okay? Um, let's do another one. Let's say we have um, f of x equals 8x minus 1. All right? Now, my question to you now is, well, I was told how to tell if two uh, uh, um, functions are inverses of one another, but what if I just want to find the inverse? What if I just want to uh, um, derive it myself? Well, you can do that, okay? You can uh, algebraically uh, figure out your own, your, your inverse. So remember a second ago, uh, I was saying that they undo each other and the, 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 the domain and range of my original function becomes the range and domain of the uh, inverse function. This is true. And an easy way to find the inverse of a function is just switch your x's and your y's. That's switching the domain and the range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to write this y equals, I said y and I wrote x. I'm writing this as x equals 8y minus 1. Okay? I renamed this y and then I changed places of x and y. And now I'm going to solve for y. That's going to get me my inverse. So this means x plus 1 equals 8y, and if I divide both sides by 8, I get y equals 1 eighth of x, that's this part, plus 1 eighth, okay? That's the inverse of this. And the way we write this is f with a superscript of negative 1 of x equals 1 eighth x plus 1 eighth. And you might be saying to yourself, gosh, that looks a lot like an exponent. I know, I know, if I could change this notation, I would, but I can't. I don't have that kind of power. Uh, that does not mean uh, f to the negative 1 power, okay? It means the inverse function of f. Now, if I had written f of x to the negative 1 power, well, okay. Now that would be 1 over f of x, sure, because now that's an exponent. That's an exponent. That's not. I know. I, I know.
Okay. So, uh, so how do you how do you find the inverse? You rename f of x y, and then you switch your x's and y's, and then you solve for the y, and then you rename y f inverse of x. Works every time. Actually, it doesn't. It works every time when it works. Let's look at another example. Let's look at the example of um, f of x equals x minus 2 squared minus 7. Okay? Uh, so, let's see. I want to look at a mapping diagram. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to restrict the domain to just, I don't know, five numbers. One, or, <laughs> I said one and I wrote zero. Zero, wow. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay? So these are my x's, and here are my y's over here. Okay, 0 minus 2 gets me negative 2, squared gets me 4, minus 7 is negative 3. So 0 maps to negative 3. 1 minus 2 is uh, negative 1, squared is 1, minus 7 is negative 6. 2 minus 2, well, that's just 0. Squared is still 0. Minus 7 is negative 7. 3 minus 2 is 1. Squared is still 1. Minus 7 is... Ne oh, I've already got a negative 6. So I'm going to say negative 6 like this. 4 minus 2 is 2. Squared is 4. Minus 7 is negative 3. So 4 actually maps up to this negative 3. Here's where the problem is. Remember, the inverse of this function should take this and map it to this. So that means I'm looking for a function that has negative 3, negative 6, and negative 7 as my x's and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 as my y's, and you can see what's happening already. Negative 3 is going to map to both 0 and 4. Uh-uh, that's not a function. Remember, f of negative 3 has to just be one answer, one consistent answer. It can't sometimes be 0 and sometimes be 4. So, I'm afraid this isn't working out. It looks like we simply can't find an inverse to this function. Unless, unless we restrict the domain, okay? If I restrict the domain so that it does just, each uh, number in the domain does just map to one number in the range, well then I should make it work, okay? There's a word for this. Actually, there's two words for this. One word is invertible, okay? Which means like what it sounds it means. You can take an inverse. There's another word for this, or actually it's three words put together, uh, which is more common, and that is one to one, okay? This, I'm gonna turn this into a one to one function. You can only take the inverse of a one to one function. All right. What we were just noticing here when we were uh, uh, looking at our mapping diagram is that this function, if I don't restrict the domain, this function act actually is a many-to-one function instead of a one-to-one -one function. Many-to-one isn't a, a, a term that's used that much, but one-to-one -one absolutely is. So how am I going to do this? Well, the problems seem to happen... Uh, after we crossed two. Remember, we got an answer for zero, and then one, and then two, and then once we got to three, that's when things started duplicating. And as it turns out, yes, two is the culprit. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to restrict this to x is greater than or equal to 2. In a second, I'll show you how you can figure that out. All right? No, I'll do it right now. This is a parabola. Okay? Uh, parabolas look like this. Well, this one looks like this. Okay? As long as uh, my x term is, as long as there's, there's no negative coefficient right there, then it's going to look like this opening up. Okay? What we have to do to restrict our domain is we have to take the left, the left side of the parabola or the right side of the parabola. Okay? So basically, you have to uh, take your vertex of the parabola and you're either going to use this side or you're going to use this side. That way, you don't have this problem right here where you have two different x's corresponding to the same y. Okay? In essence, what this means is the graph of your function must not only pass a vertical line test to show that it's a function, but it also has to pass a horizontal line test to show it's a one-to-one -one function. All right, so let's just say, and you can arbitrarily pick whether it's going to be x is greater than or equal to 2 or x is less than or equal to 2. We're going to say it's going to be greater than or equal to 2. Now we can find the inverse. All right, so what do I do? I'm going to say x equals uh, uh, y minus 2 squared minus 7, and then I'm going to solve for, uh, uh, for the y. Okay, add the 7 to both sides. I get x plus 7 equals uh, y minus 2 squared. And now I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Now, normally, when you take the square root of both sides, in front of the radical sign, you've got to put a little plus or minus, right? Not this time. Because this time, we know, well, once we switched our y's, we now get that y is greater than or equal to 2. Okay? It's, yes, that's right. We know that y is greater than or equal to 2, so that means we know that this here is going to be uh, greater than or equal to uh, 0. So when I say... Uh, the absolute value of, sorry, the, the square root of x plus 7 equals y minus 2. I know that this is greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, I can just leave this as positive. Okay? That's, that's an essential thing. Because if we put a plus or minus right here, it's no longer a function. Okay, we're almost done. Add 2 to both sides, and what you get is f inverse of x equals the square root of x plus 7 plus 2, and that is our inverse function. Okay? Let's do one more. So this time we're going to do g of x equals... Uh, the square root of x minus 4, that's right, we have a square root again, plus 3. And uh, tell you what, let's make this more interesting. Let's say it's the negative square root of x minus 4 plus 3. I want to find the inverse of this. Okay, uh, first off, uh, let me just think about what this looks like. This is going to be a square root function, and since this is negative, it's actually going to be an upside-down square root function, and so it's going to look like this. Uh, that's going to pass both the... Uh, uh, it's going to keep on going. That's going to pass both the uh, vertical line test and the horizontal line test, so this certainly looks invertible. Okay, so that means I'm going to say x equals uh, negative square root of y minus 4 plus 3. Good. Subtract 3 from both sides. You get x minus 3 equals negative uh, uh, square root of x minus 4. Let's multiply both sides by uh, negative. So negative x plus 3 equals the square root of y minus 4. Now let's square both sides, and I'm going to get uh, negative x plus 3 squared equals y minus 4. 
and then I'm going to add four to both sides. And so I'm going to have the inverse of, uh, oops, not F negative one, but G negative one. Uh, so G inverse of X is negative X plus three squared plus four. Okay. But this time what I have to do is I have to look at this and I have to say, okay, hold it. The domain of this function is going to be uh, x is greater than or equal to 4. The range of this function is a square root has to be greater than or equal to 0. A negative square root has to be less than or equal to 0. Add 3 and it has to be less than or equal to 3. So y is less than or equal to 3. So that means this function, my domain, must be the same as the range up here. Uh, so I'm just going to say for x less than or equal to 3. And if you are good at finding the, uh, uh, the um, vertex of uh, parabola, you would look at this and say, yes, it's going to have a vertex at 3 and 4. So this makes perfect sense. This time we're just taking the left side of that, uh, um, of that parabola. Okay, one last thing I'm going to show you, and that is I want to graph these two functions. Okay, so let's start with this one here. And I'm not going to make a fancy graph. Uh, I'm just going to sort of sketch it. Okay, so okay, like I said, just a sketch, nothing all that elaborate right now. Um, okay, this is going to have a vertex at the point four, three, one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a, an absolute function, but going down. So it's going to go through the point 4, 3. It's going to go through the point uh, 5, 2. It's going to go through the point 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 8, 1. So 5, 2, 8, 1. And, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Something like that. All right. Like I said, just a sketch, nothing fancy. Um, if I wanted something fancier, I'm not a great artist. If I wanted something fancier, I'd probably do it on Desmos first and then I'd, I'd be more careful. Now I want to do uh, the inverse function of G. And I believe we said that was equal to, what did we say that was equal to? Um, That's going to be uh, negative x plus 3 squared plus 4 uh, for x less than or equal to 3. Okay? So let's start with 3. I'm gonna get, it's going to go through the point uh, negative 3 plus 3 is 0. So it's going to go through the point 3, 4. 1, 2, 3. One, two, three, four, right there, okay? And then I want to count down. So if x is two, I get negative two plus three, which is one squared plus four. So that's going to be five. So I'm going through the point two, one, two, three, four, five. And then of course, I stop and say, hold it. Yeah, this was the point four, three, oh, sorry. I'm doing this wrong. This is 4, 3. This is 3, 4. Okay? And this is 2, 5, like that. Okay? Naturally, if this is going through 4, 3, 5, 2, and 8, 1, the inverse is going to go through 3, 4, 2, 5, and 1, 8 because 
you just switch your X's and Y's. That's the whole, that's the thing that inverses do. It switches the X's and the Y's. So naturally, this is gonna go through those two points, and then it's gonna go through, let's do one. So negative one plus three is two, two squared is four, plus four is eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I barely have room to get it in there. And so this is gonna look like this, all right? So what we're finding is that for every point on this original graph here, there's a corresponding point on this graph here where you just change the, uh, the coordinates, okay? You just switch your X and Y coordinates. And if you tilt your head to the right slightly, like a curious dog, then you'll see that there's a nice symmetry to this graph. That if you uh, draw the line Y equals X, that this gets reflected over here to this and the, uh, uh, so the graph of the inverse makes a perfect reflection of the graph of the original function. All right? That's quite a bit. So let's go over some of the, uh, uh, the more important points. Uh, first off, what does an inverse function do? It undoes what the original function does, okay? Secondly, uh, how can I prove that two functions are inverses of each other? Well, if f and g are inverses of each other, then I find f of g of x, I compose those two functions, and it should equal x. And I also find g of f of x, and that should equal x. So if those two uh, criteria are met, yes, they are inverses. How do I find an inverse of a function if I'm trying to figure out what the inverse is? What you do is you write it y equals some function of x, and then you switch your x's and y's, and then solve for y. That's gonna get you your inverse every single time. Nope, that's not true, not every single time, because not every single function is invertible. You have to make sure that your function is invertible first. How do you do that? You make sure that it's one to one. You make sure that every single x corresponds to one and only one y, and that every single y corresponds to one and only one x. An easy way to do this, visually, is to graph the function and make sure not only does it pass the vertical line test, which shows it's a function, but it also has to pass the horizontal line test, okay? Then, if you graph both the function and its inverse, you will notice that for every point on the original function, there is a corresponding point on the inverse function where your coordinates are, uh, are switched around, and that if you tilt your head like a curious dog and you draw the line y equals x, it'll have this beautiful symmetry about it, okay? That's what you need to know about inverse functions. All right, see you later.